I'm Josh Nelson, Nelson Elder Care Law. Um, why should you listen to me? We're the largest elder law firm in the state. We've helped over 6,000 families. I'm also the vice chair of the state bar's elder law section. So pretty authoritative and know what I'm talking about. Today, we have people of all different kinds of educational starting points. And so we're gonna go anywhere from foundational all the way into detail. I'm definitely going to leave time at the end to answer any questions that you guys have. And of course, if you have questions that you don't feel like asking the group, happy to answer them side by side later. Whenever we jump into it, though, I can use a clicker. We're going to talk about four essential documents that everyone needs. You can't walk from the speaker and always get reverb. Let's try this. The biggest thing that we start with is the advanced directive for healthcare. Does everybody have an advanced directive for healthcare? Right. So this is really important. This is who you're going to nominate to make medical decisions for you in the event that you lose your ability to. What's the hesitance of getting this? The fear that I'm giving away power. You go to your mom or dad and you're like, hey, let's go ahead and get an estate plan in place. Their biggest fear is that you're going to put them in a home. They're going to lose their authority. That's not how this tool works. Whenever we talk about the Advanced Healthcare Directive, in the state of Georgia, it's called that. Everywhere else in the world, it's called a medical power of attorney. Is that a term that more people are familiar with? Yeah. Back in 2012, we used to call it a medical power of attorney too. And then agents or children would have a financial power of attorney and think they could make medical decisions or have a medical power of attorney and think that they could make financial decisions. And so in all our legislature's wisdom, they said, let's simplify this by calling it something new nobody else has ever heard. And that's the advanced directive for healthcare. The biggest deal here is that it only has one decision maker at a time. And so what do I mean by that? If you have the capacity to make your own medical decisions, you get to. The person that you've authorized is your agent has no authority. So when do we use this? Usually, if we're incapacitated, we have cognitive impairment, something like dementia or Alzheimer's, or we're in so much pain that we choose not to make our own medical decisions. Has anybody ever go to the ER with like a major headache or after an accident? Maybe you're just a little dazed and confused. And yeah, you could technically make those decisions, but you're like, hey, it'd really do me better if my spouse could make it or my daughter could make it. From the person that gives the authority perspective, it's important to make sure that we're talking them through this so that they don't feel like they're losing power because this is the scary one. This is the one that people feel is the put me in the home kind of thing. If you're taking your mom and dad through some kind of procedure and they don't have this because you tried to have that conversation and you just weren't ever successful, you can get this as you're doing that surgery pre-op. You can get this right there in the hospital. Why do we need it? Sometimes our spouse isn't the person that we want to make medical decisions for us. Especially in a blended family, it can cause family dynamics. A blended family, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, is whenever we have a second marriage and children from a previous relationship. Maybe your daughter or son is a nurse, and you want them to be the ones that are making those decisions. This is how we appoint that. The next tool that we talk about is the durable power of attorney. This is a little different than what we just talked about with the medical power of attorney, because not only can you act, but the person that you nominate as your agent can act too. So you could be sitting in your house and still have full capacity, and you could let your agent go do things on your behalf. What are some things that they can do? They can sign contracts. They can go get money out of your bank account. They can talk with your financial advisor, make trades, stop trades. They can create a trust on your behalf. Can anybody guess what the two things they can't do, no matter what are? They can't change your will. 
A power of attorney in the state of Georgia cannot change your will. They can change beneficiary designations if you've given them that power, though. So like on your bank account, your normal checking account where your income comes in, you guys should all have what's called TOD or transfer on death on that account. If you have that, your power of attorney can go change that for you. So what do we need to make sure that we know about this person? That we trust them completely. Sometimes if you're talking with your parent and they aren't quite ready for you to have this authority, they're going to ask you to do something that I don't recommend. It's called having a springy power of attorney. Has anybody ever heard that term before? Generally, whenever you have a power of attorney, it's effective as soon as it's signed, which means right after your parent signs their part, you could go do things on their behalf. Sometimes before it comes to a child, attorneys will write in language that says, this is only effective if two medical professionals or a judge say that it is. What's the problem with that? Doctors hate lawyers. Why do doctors hate lawyers? Because they got deep pockets and they're afraid we're going to come after them. So how many doctors do you think are going to take on the liability of sitting across from your parent and saying, I'll sign off on her not being able to handle her money? Knowing how much liability that comes, it's never going to happen, let alone two of them. And why would you let a judge make that decision if the whole idea of doing this planning is to keep you out of the court system anyway? This is why I don't like springing powers of attorney. You need to make sure that you trust the person and you feel confident with them having the power right away. Because in the case of an emergency, you aren't going to find two doctors and that judge takes a minimum of three to five days and costs a lot of money to get their signature on that paper. How do we have a conversation with our parent about this? How do we talk to somebody and make them feel empowered that they still have their autonomy, but say we want to help? Honestly, you have to go with them and not play games. You have to be blunt and say, I'm looking to be able to help. I want to be able to control things if you couldn't. I don't want to do anything for you right now, but I want to be legally equipped whenever you need me. That honest conversation is going to go a long way. The next tool that we talk about is really talking about a HIPAA release form. You guys have this at all your doctors and your parents do too. Whenever they go for your new appointment after the year, and they ask you if you change your insurance and they give you that big packet of stuff to fill out, buried in there is a sheet of paper that says, who can we talk to? The one that you fill out with that doctor is only generally good for that doctor. Or if it's like with Kaiser, it's only good inside the Kaiser network. Has anybody here ever traveled? Probably all of us. What happens if it's only good at Kaiser and we go out of state? Nobody can talk to your doctor. Nobody can talk to that ER person. Flip side, I know we're talking about aging parents here, but this is important for your minor kids as they turn into adults too. You got kids or grandkids going off to college, make sure that they're aware that this is important because all of a sudden you get that call, even as a parent, you can't get the information you need from the hospital. This is not a decision-making tool. This is just a list of people that medical professionals can talk to. Even with all the technology that's out there right now, one of the things that scares me to death is that like an MRI is still transferred on a disc. Say that you had something so tragic that you need to get an MRI taken, you probably aren't great to just go pick that thing up three days later, right? Anybody listed on this tool? And go get it. You have multiple kids that are trying to share responsibilities. This, you can have all of them be able to go pick it up, talk to them, things like that. Do we think that that's helpful? Helps kind of push down some of the family dynamics? Here's the pro tip since we have all of you here today. Doctors don't want to talk to you if they aren't getting paid. 
as a HIPAA authorized person, how do you get to talk to mom's primary care person without just getting all the gatekeepers that the doctor has? Telehealth. It's like the great thing that's happened in the last couple of years. You can schedule a telehealth through Medicaid, or sorry, Medicare, as long as you three-way call the person that's insured at the beginning of the appointment, the next 15 minutes are covered. Doctors will get on the phone with you if they're getting paid. This is super helpful if your parent lives out of state or you're unable to make their appointments because you're still working. The next tool that we talk about has a lot of confusion around it. Who here knows what a DNR is, a do not resuscitate order? It might surprise you, but in Georgia, we don't actually have those. In Georgia, we call it something else. Does anybody know what we call it? Nobody? A P-O-L-S-T, a pulse, physician's order for life-saving treatment. So in Georgia, if you have something that says DNR on it, do not resuscitate, it is 100% not a legal tool. In Georgia, a lawyer cannot give you a DNR. The P in PULSE stands for physician. So it has to be signed off by a doctor. Why? Most of us don't really want a DNR, and most of our parents don't really want a DNR. What a pulse in Georgia says is that if you get so sick that your heart stops, your brain stops, you have a heart attack, the EMS, whenever they come, they can't even do CPR. They can't do paddles. You're dead. I'm up here hot and glistening. If I drop dead from a heart attack right now, I swear to God, I want you guys to revive me. <laughs> do not kill me. <laughs> but that's what a DNR says. Even with great modern medicine, if you have a heart attack, but you have a pulse, you're gone. Most people don't want that. The normal standard in Georgia to get one without talking to your doctor or your doctor just being your buddy is you need to be over 88 or suffer from at least mild cognitive impairment or need help with at least two activities of daily living. I work with a lot of people that make this decision and it's the right decision for them. This is hard for children to own. Today, I was sitting across from a lady who came in with her daughter. They both had matching hair, literally cut the same way, dyed the same way. I'm surprised they weren't wearing matching shirts. They could finish each other's sentences. And for that daughter to hear that her mom really wanted this was heartbreaking. But her mom had been through a lot of medical procedures lately, and she doesn't want to keep fighting. So it's important that that mom talk to her physician and get this, if that's what she wants. She specifically doesn't want any extra surgeries. She doesn't want to have CPR. She's very religious, and she says if it's her time, she's happy to go meet the Lord. That brought tears to her daughter's eyes, like it would for all of us if we're sitting there hearing our parents say that. I can't do that, though, because I'm not a doctor. So what does a lawyer do? It's a little different. This is what most of us want whenever we say we want a DNR. It's called a living will. In the law, we like to confuse terms. So a lot of people think that we're talking about where your stuff goes when you die. That's not what a living will is. That's what's called a last will and testament. A living will says, if I get really, really sick, where I need the help of machinery or advanced medical treatment, such as a feeding tube, a breathing apparatus, if I'm not gonna get better, if I'm going to be in a vegetative state because my medical issue is irreversible and will be terminal if they stop that treatment, I still want them to stop that treatment. I want to pass naturally. If you don't make this decision with the living will, 
the person that is nominated as your advanced healthcare directive agent has the obligation to make this decision. And I say that as obligation because that's what it is. Helping your loved ones, whether it be your spouse or your kids, make this decision before they get to the point that it actually has to be done, takes so much burden off of them. It's not like in the movies where we remove this kind of treatment and you just hear a like long beat. If we remove life-sustaining treatment from somebody, they can still live for minutes or hours or sometimes even days. And the amount of guilt that comes from that for an adult child in you guys' shoes is immense. Having your parent make this decision lets you know it's what they wanted so that you don't have to be put in that spot. You making that for your loved ones puts so much more ease on them. It helps the grieving process. There's a couple versions of this, and I would caution you against two of them. If you find an old one online prior to 2017, it will have a grid that says, if I get cancer, I want this. If I get Parkinson's, I want this. Don't do that one. The problem with that is that the first reaction most people have whenever they get a crazy diagnosis is, what are my options? If you're locked into that grid or you lock your agent into that grid, they have to follow those instructions Five years ago, if you would have marked, if I get cancer, I don't want chemo. You wouldn't be aware that chemo today is massively different than it was even five years ago. Those are the things that people just don't keep up with. And so I'd say stay away from that. The other one that people see is it has three options on the first page that says, I don't want hydration, I don't want food, and I don't want food or hydration. Everybody always marks, I want hydration, because they don't understand the medical ramification of that. With modern medicine, if we keep you hydrated and hooked up to the machines, you will live for almost ever. That's not really what most people want if they're doing this tool. Help guide your family so that we aren't doing that. The way that we do it, is we ask the people conversationally what they want, and then we make sure that their living well matches it, but we don't go down all those intricacies of hydration because that's a misstep that a lot of people make. Any questions about that? All right. Why did we not talk about a last will? We went through four tools and we didn't talk about a last will and testament. You guys have spent your whole life been told you need a will. Why I'm up here not talking about that? Because that only controls what happens whenever you die. And we're worried about how do we take care of our loved ones while they're alive. Whenever you pass away, the state has a plan for you no matter what. Even if you don't have a will, part of your stuff goes to your spouse if you have one. If you don't have a spouse, it goes to your kids. That's what most people end up doing anyway. Blended families again, Definitely need a will. But as of July, we have a new tool. In Georgia, we started doing what's called transfer on death deeds. 25 other states have had these for absolute ever. In Georgia, it's just started here in July. What does it do that's different about your deed? For a lot of people, this is going to make what used to be complex planning more simple. But for other people, it's going to complicate things. If you come and talk to an attorney, one of the things that we will absolutely tell you is be very cautious with putting anybody else's names on your assets. If you go talk to your bank teller, they tell you to put your kids on your bank account. Do not do that. They are wrong. Say that I put my daughter on my bank account, and then later on, she gets creditors. And I'm not talking about just Capital One. 
It could be medical stuff because she doesn't have the health insurance she should have. It could be that she gets divorced and all of a sudden they look at her assets and now all of a sudden my bank account is considered as part of her assets. Now all of a sudden I got a problem. And so this is why elder law attorneys in general are gonna tell you, you don't need to put anybody's name on your assets. But people want to avoid a thing called probate. Probate is the legal process of going through the court system to say where somebody who passed away is stuck goes. It takes between six and 12 months and the average fee is 3% of your stock. So if you have a million dollars, it costs you 30 grand. The other issue that you run into with it though, is that people will specifically avoid probate at the cost of things like taxes. Who's been in their house for more than five years? Whenever you bought your house, it was probably worth more than $250,000 less than what it is today if you've owned it for five years. You've had a heck of a market rise, right? If it's your house and it's your primary residence, the IRS allows you to sell that house and not pay taxes on it. Anybody that's not a tax firm never thinks about that, right? But like whenever you go sell your home, you don't generally pay capital gains. The IRS wants every other dollar from you that they can get. Why do they give you that tax break? Because we want to promote homeownership. And so the first $250,000 is considered exempt of your primary residence or half a million dollars if you're married. Anything else in your life where you make half a million dollars, the IRS is going to take about 40% of that. So let's talk about the common mistake people make with their deed. It's between you and your spouse, or maybe your parents. Dad dies, because statistically dad always dies first, right? Mom's on the deed and didn't have to go through probate whenever dad died, because there were a couple magic words on that deed. It said joint tenants with rights of survivorship. Because mom and dad both lived in that house as their primary residence, if mom sells it, even while she's alive, and it's less than half a million dollars a gain, she gets it tax-free still. But let's say that my mom adds me, Josh, onto her deed after my dad dies. Mom passes. I just skipped probate. I feel really good about that. I go to sell mom's house, and the closing attorney gives me a 1099. What do we know about 1099s? <laughs> All of a sudden, you got to pay tax on something, right? I got to pay tax because I wasn't ever a resident in my mom's house. I don't get that. What's called Section 121 step up in basis. So I skipped probate, which may have cost a couple thousand dollars, but now I owe the IRS a lot. That's bad planning. That's what happens whenever we do things piecemeal. Whenever we look at TikTok videos and they tell us how to skip probate, they never tell us how to skip the taxes too. And so this is where a lot of people get into problems. After you've already sold the house and gotten that 1099, can you go back retroactively to the IRS and say, oopsies? No. There's no reviews, right? The other big deal that we're running into is you've often heard recently that the state of Georgia has changed the way they're dealing with state school tax exemptions. So right now, Cherokee County used to give all the seniors a break on their taxes. So instead of being like four or $5,000 a year, it was like a grant. 20% of what everybody else pays. That's great. But a new state law just came down that said now you have to live in the county for five years before you can qualify for that. So they're going to get some money from you before they give you the tax break. Why did that happen? Because other counties were getting mad that seniors were moving to these counties and losing the tax base because Cherokee County is 20% of the tax that Bartow was. You moved to Lake Arrowhead, which is arguably marketed as a senior-friendly community, 
and you don't get a tax break? It seems silly, right? Finally, our legislature did something really cool, though. In March, they voted to an act which called a transfer on death deed. Remember earlier whenever we talked about your bank account that could have a transfer on death? The advantage of that for your bank account was that your kids weren't on your bank account. It wasn't an asset of theirs. We can now do that with deeds. You can record a deed that's called a transfer on death deed, often called a Todd, that says while you're alive, the house is 100% your house. Whenever you die, without going through probate, whoever you listed as that TOD beneficiary now can get that house by just signing one piece of paper and showing you that certificate. That's pretty cool. When do we not want to use this? If we have multiple children, it becomes problematic. If we have three kids, do we think that they're going to split the house equally? Your parents will say yes. The siblings will say, yeah, but my sister's going to do X, Y, Z. And so one of the big problems that we run into in states that have had this transfer on death deed for a while is that if the people that inherit it fight, you're still back in court in what's called a partition action which is where the court says we're going to force the sale because one of the three kids wants to sell. That's going to come down the pipeline. The other thing is it won't be except for one time distribution. So a lot of times people will focus on having a trust to avoid probate. If you have a trust to avoid probate, you can make distributions over time. You still get to step up the basis at the end, and you don't have the partition problem. The problem is the trust is more expensive than this is. So for people that truly have simple plans, a TODD could be helpful. Whenever we start talking about our aging parents, one of the things that we have to remember is where you can have a trust that protects that home from Medicaid on a transfer on death fee, Medicaid still gets paid back from this before the kids get to assume the house. So say that mom goes into a nursing home for five months before she passes away, and then it says TODD on her house to the three kids. The three kids will have to come up with the money to reimburse the state for what Medicaid paid, or they're going to have to sell the house, then the state gets it through their lane. But if you really do just have a simple plan, one kid or two kids or three kids that you really think are going to fight, this is a very economical way to avoid probate and still get those tax benefits that you used to get through just a trust. So we went through our four tools. We talked about a will. We talked about Todd. I'm going to open it up for Q&A. Who has any questions for me?